Joyce Meyer Ministries dankt haar donateurs die deze uitzending mogelijk maakten. There's too much compromise in the church today. Too many people have got one foot in the world and one foot in the kingdom. They want to do what the world does and still think they're going to go to heaven. And it's just not working. We've been talking about the different names of God in the Bible. And the reason why I'm doing that is because a name tells you about someone. They're properly called, especially the ones in the Old Testament, the redemptive names of God, because each one tells you something that you can expect God to do for you. And we started out with Yahweh, which literally means I am. And that's still my favorite. I love that thought that who is God? He is. Hebrews 11:6 6 says, those that come to him must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. God has a reward for those that are faithful. You have a reward coming. And I could even go so far as to say that I believe that since you took your time to be here this weekend, many of you made a real investment to be here. You've spent money for hotels and you've traveled and just sacrificed time. And I believe that you will have a reward. When we make right choices, there's always a reward that comes in our life. God doesn't owe us anything for us making right choices, but he loves to bless his children. So I always like to tell people, payday's coming, amen? And um, so we've talked about a variety of these names. I'm not, I cannot go back over all of them, but the reason why I wanted to do this and why I'm calling it Who is God is because I think that God's reputation in the world needs to be better. I think that we need to do a better job of letting God shine through us so people can think better of God. A lot of the division in churches and the, the foolish ways that some believers act, especially people that are publicly known and then they do all kinds of goofy things that gives a bad name to Christianity. It's a shame the way that the world now seems to disrespect God. And so I'm busy trying to make his name famous and I'd like you to help me, amen? Um, and obviously, there's lots of other people doing the same thing around the earth. Who is God? Well, he's just absolutely the greatest, the most high, the most amazing, the most wonderful. I mean, he's just everything and anything that you could ever hope for or want. And my contention is, is that anybody who really knows God, any person in the world who is not a believer, or who claims to not believe in God, or even those who don't have a relationship with God. Anybody who really knows him could not possibly not want to have a relationship with God. <laughs> Period, end of the conversation. In him we live and move and have our being. God is not a sideline to me, he's the main line in my life. He's not just something He's everything, and I know that many of you feel the exact same way. So we've gone through several of these names, and we have these messages from the weekend recorded if you weren't here and you'd like to get them. And today I have three of the redemptive names left that I want to go through and then end up with a few things about the name of Jesus because the interesting thing is that all these other redemptive names that we see describing who God is all culminate and come together for us as New Covenant believers in the one name that is above every name, the name of Jesus. You know, it's interesting to me, I, I don't know about you, but I, even when I speak that name and I purposely think about what I'm saying, I almost feel like I can sense an atmosphere change. There's something powerful in the name of Jesus. Let's all say, Jesus. One more time. Jesus. One more time. Jesus. 
Wow. There's no other name that does that for me like the name of Jesus. And so today we've come to the name Jehovah Nisi, which means the Lord our banner. And it basically means that he is our victory or he's the one who gives us victory. And we can really expect God, expect God, not just have to kind of wait and see, but we can expect God to give us victory over sin, over addictive habits, over all kinds of bondages, over a painful past, victory over the enemy. He is in the business of giving his people victory. You are the head and not the tail, above and not beneath. In Daniel 11:32, the Bible says, those who know their God shall prove themselves strong and shall stand strong and do exploits for God. I love that. If you know God, not just if you go to church, going to church is lovely. I highly recommend that everybody be very regular in being plugged into a good local church where you can learn and grow and be accountable. But it's those who know their God. I went to church for a lot of years and didn't know God. Is there anybody here who agrees with me that you can go to church a long time and not know God? You can know doctrine. You can know church rules. You can know religious regulations. But that doesn't mean that we know God. And sadly, very sadly, heartbreakingly sadly, the way that religion presents him sometimes is so far away from who he really is. It just seems like that many times by the time somebody gets you very indoctrinated in religion, you just, everything is deep and serious and sad and sour and you can't enjoy anything and everything's about what you can't do. You can't do this. You can't do that. You can't do something else. Well, what about the things we can do? Let's think about the things we can do. My Bible says that Jesus came that we might have and enjoy our lives and have it in abundance to the full until it overflows. And the only things that God asks us not to do are the things that are killing us anyway. All the rest of it, he wants us to enjoy and have fun. Being a Christian doesn't mean that you don't have fun anymore. It means that you have more fun than you ever have in your whole life because you can enjoy things that other people couldn't even possibly enjoy. I mean, I'm telling you the truth. Lighten up. Get over yourself. Come on. Religion is intense. But Jesus said, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I will ease, relieve, and refresh your souls. Actually, the Amplified Bible says, I will give you blessed recreation for your souls. And so literally, if you understand that, you can live your life with your soul on vacation. Thank God in him, you don't have to wait to go take a trip to enjoy yourself. You can enjoy yourself every day of your life. Amen? Some of you are thinking, oh man, this has been so great. I hate to go home. Well, see, you're already setting yourself up for a fit when you walk in the door. You're going, ah, man, this house is a mess, and I told you, man, 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 man. And then people think, yeah, we're well, going, did you a lot of good, but you maybe ought to go back again. So don't dread going home. Don't dread anything in your life, because Jehovah Nisi, the one who gives you victory, is with you. You have victory in your life. I mean, if a sink full of dirty dishes is going to depress you, what hope is there for anything else? Yeah, in case you didn't hear me, I said, if a sink full of dirty dishes is going to depress you. No, you're a soldier in the army of God. You attack those dishes. You attack that closet that needs to be cleaned out. You stand up to the things you need to do. Matter of fact, why don't you on purpose do the hard things first and just get them out of the way?
Let's stop being so wimpy and whining about everything. Let us, those who know their God shall be mighty and do exploits. See, I had to start with little things like that in my home. I can tell you the truth. If this, if these things that I'm teaching you are not working in your home, then you can forget about them working anywhere else. If the only place where we have the victory is in church, then we have a deep problem. Amen? Get it working at home where it really counts. Exodus 17, 8 through 15. Then came Amalek, the descendants of Esau, and fought with Israel at Rephidim. And Moses said to Joshua, choose us out men and go out, fight with Amalek, and tomorrow I will stand on top of the hill with the rod of God in my hand. Now, God had placed his power in that rod that Moses had, and it, that rod was what was stretched out over the Red Sea when it parted. So Joshua did as Moses said, and he fought with Amalek, and Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the hilltop. And when Moses held up his hand, Israel prevailed, and when he lowered his hand, Amalek prevailed. <laughs> But Moses' hands were heavy and grew weary, so the other men took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it. So don't ever complain about your seat. He was sitting on a rock. <laughs> then Aaron and Hur held up his hands, one on one side and one on the other, and we all need people to hold our hands up when we get tired and weary. Amen. And that could be your whole ministry. You're, you may not be called to be the main person. You may be called to hold up somebody's hands. And Joshua mowed down and disabled Amalek and the people with the sword. And the Lord said to Moses, write this for memorial in the book and rehearse it in the ears of Joshua, and I will utterly blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under the heavens. In verse 15, and Moses built an altar and called the name of it, the Lord is my banner, which means sign of conquest. So really in essence, when he said, Jehovah Nisi, the Lord is my banner, what he literally meant is make no mistake, God is the one who has given us this victory. And let me tell you, God is a God who gives victory. And whatever situation you're in right now, you need to stop being afraid of it, and you need to know your God and know that you can do whatever you need to do and that however long it takes, and nobody knows exactly what that is, but the battle's already won, and when it's over, you will have the victory. You will have the victory. I know it by experience, and I know it by the Word of God. Now, one of the areas that God always gives us victory over is sin. But I want you to notice in what we just read in Exodus, and this is going to be kind of a, a, a high point of what I want to bring to you this morning. Moses followed God. He did what God put on his heart to do. And when I go back all the way to the condition I was in when I first got into a real serious relationship with God, I was a churchgoer a long time before I got serious. And I always like to kind of share that because I think a lot of people are going to church and they think that's all they need to do, but what you need is victory. And if you don't have victory, then you need to start asking yourself why, and you need to start looking at the Word to see maybe what you're missing that's available to you. God has called us to be lights shining out brightly in a dark world. And that doesn't mean we have no problems, but it means that we have victory over our problems. Amen? Amen? And so if I look all the way back to the condition I was in, I mean, God has given me so much victory in my life. And it's been 37 years worth of little victories and little more victories and little victories day after day, little by little. And you know, part of our problem is we don't like the little by little. We don't like the from glory to glory because in between those glories, there's sometimes a pretty long span of time where not too much of anything is going on. Amen? Amen. 
But as I look back, I can tell you that it wasn't just because I loved God or just because I read the Word of God. I give God all the credit and all the glory, but let me tell you, you and God are partners. And God will give you things that he wants you to do, and he will also tell you some things that he doesn't want you to do. Some of them are in the Word, and they're for everybody, but there are things that God speaks to us specifically, things that he lays on our heart that are just between us and God. Times when maybe he requests sacrifices. There was one time when I had a whole bunch of money saved up for something I wanted. And I mean, we gave on a regular basis. We weren't stingy people. We were givers. But God asked me to give away everything that I had saved. <clears throat> Man, I tried to get out of that. But you know, the best thing is, is to follow God when you feel like he's leading you to do something. Now, listen to what I'm going to say. God is never, ever trying to take anything away from you. He didn't need my little money that I had saved up, but it was something that I was a little too attached to. And sometimes God will request something from us because he wants to get us detached from our attachments. And when we say, God, you're first and you're everything, sometimes he asks us to prove it. And I can pretty much guarantee you that some of you are still holding on to things that God told you to get rid of a long time ago. You're still in relationships, friendships that are hurting your walk with God, and you, you know down deep inside that it's something that's not healthy for you, but rather than be lonely for a little while, you, you keep unsafe relationships rather than maybe be by yourself for a little while and wait for God to give you the right relationships. So I want to tell you that along with all those little by littles and from glory to glories, there has been a lot of little obediences and little things that God asked me to do. And some of them were things that didn't make any sense. And some of them were things that I did understand. And I just feel that I really need to make a point today that when you're, when you're born again, let's just say you're living in total darkness. Now you step out and you're born again. But one of the first things you begin to realize is Hey, somebody has provided for me, somebody being Jesus, this awesome place down there as an inheritance where there's righteousness and peace and joy and all my needs are met. And I, boy, it's just going to be wonderful. I'm going to be free from all these bondages. But you, you can kind of see it, but there's a jungle between you and it. And that jungle is that mess in our lives that needs to be straightened out. And we have a road map through that jungle, and it's the Word of God. It's our road map. And if we simply will just one step at a time, one thing at a time, one step at a time, one thing at a time, one step at a time, let me tell you something. Get over being in a hurry and make a decision today that you're in for the long haul. And don't ever say to God, if I don't have a breakthrough soon, don't say that. We can't threaten God. What we need to say is, God, I trust your timing in my life, and this is hard because it's been so long, but I'm in for the long haul. I'm in for the long haul, and I'll tell you one even better, and you can even go ahead and say, go ahead and say, and God, even if I never get what I want, I'm still in. Even if I never get what I want, I'm still in. I'm all yours because nothing makes any sense except my relationship with you. Let's quit having all these conditions that God has to meet to keep us serving him day by day. My gosh. I mean, so many things. <laughs> and I believe with all my heart that any person in here who is still under a burden of sin, something that you can't seem to get free from. There's some kind of bondage or addiction in your life. Maybe it's bad temper. Maybe it's bitterness. So many people have such a hard time not being angry about the things that have happened to them in their life. And that is so destructive to our walk with God. You cannot have unforgiveness in your heart and have a great relationship with God at the same time. It just doesn't happen. It's in the scripture from one end of it to the other. If we won't forgive other people, then we can't receive forgiveness from God and it hurts our fellowship 
with him. And you know, let's just take that as an example. My father abused me for many years. My mother knew about it, didn't do anything about it. I even had other relatives, male relatives, that had also abused me. There was a real mess in my father's bloodline. And I mean, I had a bad case of bitterness and resentment and a chip on my shoulder. And even after I was already in ministry, because I had, I had done the what I call the official I forgive you thing. You know, most of us that have been walking with God for very long, we know that we're supposed to forgive. And so we'll, we'll say, I forgive. But a long time after that, when God really began to deal with me that it still wasn't what it needed to be, he, I, I said, it's hard. I don't know how to do it. And God said, if you'll pray for them and bless them. They were older by then needed help, help take care of them. Well, that's the last thing in the world I wanted to do. I didn't want to do that. They didn't deserve that. I was the one that had been mistreated. They never did anything for me. And I mean, I had my conversation with God. You ever notice that sometimes God says something, you argue with him, and then after that, he doesn't say anything else. It just kind of hangs there like. <laughs> yeah. I always like to think about Jonah. Jonah, go to Nineveh. He didn't want to go to Nineveh, so he went the exact opposite direction, got in a storm, got swallowed up by a whale, spent three days in the whale's belly, got vomited out on a beach, finally went back to God, and God said, go to Nineveh. <laughs> Come on, we can avoid a lot of side trips in our life by just doing what God tells us to the first time. Please understand that obedience is important. Yes, there's grace and there's forgiveness for sins and there's mercy and God's never going to stop loving you no matter what you do. And maybe you'll still get into heaven. It's not our obedience that gets us into heaven. It's faith in Jesus Christ. But I'll tell you what, I think we need to stop pushing the envelope and we need to get really committed and obedient to God. And this morning, I want to talk to you about really letting the Holy Spirit sanctify you because he is also Jehovah M. Kadesh, the Lord who sanctifies us. And that means to take the holiness that's in us by his grace and mercy and work it out in our lives. What if we have holy minds and holy mouths? What if we have some holy relationships? Come on, there's too much compromise in the church today. Too many people have got one foot in the world and one foot in the kingdom. They want to do what the world does and still think they're going to go to heaven. And it's just not working. Follow God. Don't expect him to follow you. Amen. Don't make your plans and then pray that God will make them work. Pray, see what God says, and then make your plan. Amen. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. Three scriptures here. But thanks be to God who in Christ Jesus leads us in triumph as trophies of Christ's victory. And through us spreads and makes evident the fragrance of the knowledge of God everywhere. God always leads us in triumph. A.M. Amen. <laughs> A.M. And not just in the A.M., but all day long. Mercy. 1 Corinthians 15, 56. Now sin is the sting of death, and sin exercises its power upon the soul through the abuse of the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory, making us conquerors through our Lord Jesus Christ. Christ. How about if every day early in the morning we say, thanks be to God who gives me the victory this day and every day of my life. Well, God is our victory and he lives in us through his Holy Spirit. He sanctifies us, sets us apart for a special purpose. Thankfully, we don't have to try to change ourselves we can allow God to do it. All we need to do is to cooperate with him. We just need to kind of let go and let God be God. 
You know, everything that I know that I teach you and everything that I know about God, I've learned from His Word. I don't even know how to begin to tell you how powerful and how important the Word of God is. The Bible actually shows us that there is inherent power in the Word of God. That means when I study the Word, when I speak the Word, each one of those words is like a little power capsule that when it's spoken, it's like it breaks open in my life and produces that power that changes and changes circumstances and changes people and drives the enemy away. Eh, lo hacía escondida de todo, pero yo con 13 años lo pillé. También escuchaba cómo a veces él le pegaba. Entonces, eh, si bien mi mamá siempre trató de mantener la familia como en secreto, esas cosas. Que no, que era fea, que, no, que nadie me pescaba que no había esperanza en mí, que mis manos eran feas, mi cara. Me miraba al espejo y lloraba. Dos veces traté de ahorcarme. Well, at Hand of Hope, the outreach arm of Joyce Meyer Ministries, we are honored to work alongside Teen Challenge to help people break the chains of addiction and to see all that God has created them to be. Patricia and Norbert, would you begin by telling us about the need for a home like this here in Chile? Well, we have uh, the situation with uh, the women growing up in atmospheres where men abuse them. And through that abuse, women are turning to drugs like never before. The men beat them up, they turn them into slaves, they make them do the drug runs. And so they are afraid to, st to step out. They are afraid to go back to their families. It's a nine to 12 month program. We have a curriculum that gives them step-by-step -step discipleship in which they can grow in Christ. Once they're mature enough, they're reunited with their children. And when they live that dream of being free from drugs and being free from those things that cause them to turn to drugs, then they can be the mother that they need to be. Jimena, you are such an important part of all of these women's stories because of the way that you play a huge role in their healing. What are some of the particular troubles that women are dealing with? La necesidad de amor, del abrazo familiar, del abrazo de alguien que te ama, lo que buscan, lo que necesitan, lo que transforma. Porque mis manos eh, son instrumentos de Dios. Y esta es mi familia. Ellas son mis hijas. Cuando supe que Él me perdonó, a pesar de que le hacía daño también a la gente al vender droga, eso me, me sentí súper porque alguien me amaba así como yo era. You said before that you couldn't even stand to look in a mirror because of how ugly you felt. What do you see now? Cuando estoy trabajando, mucha gente se acerca a mí y me dice, oh, su sonrisa, usted tiene algo especial. A ver qué, es especial. Y una vez me detuve y miré al espejo, pero miré mis ojos. Y me dijo, yo hice esto. Y era mi rostro. What an amazing privilege to see the way that these women are blooming, the way that the beauty that God has put in them is now coming out so that they can see it. And when you help a woman 
it flows over into her children, into her families, and it changes so many lives. That is what Project Girl is all about, sharing the beauty. And you can do that with us right here in Chile, as we've been talking about, and in many, many places all over the world. You know, the Word of God teaches us that if we are willing to share what we have, God can multiply that and make it into a lot more than what we started with. So please share. Help ons om andere mensen te kunnen helpen. Bel ons 026 20 22 100 of ga naar joyce-meijer.nl slash partner. Elk gebed en elke donatie telt. Samen veranderen we de wereld. Do you think that your thoughts are random and meaningless? Or do they affect you more than you realize? Well, God's Word teaches us the importance of our thoughts. In Strijd in je Denken legt Joyce uit waarom letterlijk alles in ons leven samenhangt met ons denken. Actually, everything in life begins with a thought, even the changes that you might be looking for. Deze bestseller, met een oplage van ruim 6 miljoen exemplaren, heeft het leven van veel mensen al veranderd. Bestel strijd in je denken door te bellen met 026 20 22 100 of online via joy-meyer.nl slash strijd. Een dag begint pas goed met een goed ontbijt. En een dagelijkse overdenking van Joyce. Nieuwe impulsen en bemoedigende gedachten die je zullen sterken tijdens je dag. Abonneer je gratis op de overdenkingen op joy-meyer.nl slash overdenking of op Facebook. Begin je dag goed, het is het waard.